Welcome, everybody else. Great to be here this morning. And uh, whether you're here live here in person, or if you're live streaming right now, or if you're live streaming later uh, in, in the day or week, we're glad you're here. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, continuing our third week. We're in our third week of a series on uh, grace and uh, isn't it great to sing songs like we've just done all day today that remind us of God's great love for us? Now, I'm, I'm really missing some folks today, and this has been this way for the last several weeks, but I don't know, I just, I'm feeling it a little bit more today. Uh, but I saw, I sat, I was looking around at who is here, and there's only a few uh, because we're trying to be wise about how we come and we don't want to fill the building too, too full, so we know that a lot of people are at home, and that's good, and that's a, the right place for you. But when I saw sitting over on this side, just Leanne Singleton was all by herself, and it made me say, Kevin, Kimberly, you know, where, where are you? You know, Isaac, you know, wh where are you? I mean, there's this whole group of folks that are supposed to be sitting over this side, and supposedly they're the sheep. So what's up with that? I mean, you know, it seems like the sheep would be here. They'd be the ones that, no, I, I, I totally get it. But I am looking forward to that day. Aren't we all, when we all get here together and we can worship together, it's, it's great. But, but right now, it's good too. Love it to see the folks who are, who are all around the country, really, who are checking in with us and worshiping with us today. Today we're going to talk about a... a Pretty famous story and maybe the less famous part of the story. But we're going to talk about grace, and uh, this is where we've been for the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I want to do a little review. I think maybe next time we're actually going to have a quiz that we pass out, and you know, you get to sit uh, according to your quiz score. But that first week, we talked about prevenient grace, and the second week, we talked about justifying grace. And so this, here's the quiz, is this justifying grace or prevenient grace right here? Before we were ever born, God was preparing the way for us to have a dynamic, life-giving relationship with Him. Which is it? Prevenient. Yes. Oh, wow. We are right on it. These guys are learners. I'm excited for, about that. You know, maybe you guys could go to college. Uh, someday if the pandemic is ever over. <laughs> Next, then, if it's, we only got two choices, so you would know that this is justifying grace. God making things right. Sometimes we think we're going to make something right, and we try. But there's some things we just can't do on our own. We can't do it by ourselves. We need God to make things right for us. And, and he does this not because we deserve it, but because he loves us. And so God's Love is overwhelming. It's amazing. It's nonstop. It never ends. But sometimes we don't experience the joy and the peace that we, that we think we should from God's grace and God's gifts. And, and that's because there are some, what we're going to talk about today, obstacles to grace. There's some things that keep us from really enjoying the gifts that, that we've been given by God. And, and so one thing about the, the grace of God is it is a gift, but it's our choice whether we're going to receive it or not. We still have a, a choice in the matter. Uh, God runs us down always, always giving us grace, but never forcing us to receive it. That's our choice. And so we're going to talk about that, and I think maybe no story... Uh, ever talks about that as well as the story of the older brother in Luke 15. So that's what we're, we're, we're going to head today. And, and we're going to begin with the context of the story. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about Kezaza. Let's just practice a little Kezaza before uh, we talk about it. Okay, so I'm going to say Kezaza and you're going to say yeah, I, and you know, that might not be how you pronounce it, but that's how I pronounce it. I looked up several places, uh, you know, on the internet, how do you pronounce it? And there was five or six different ones, you know, like they were all certain that they were the right one, but eh. 
I'm going to give them some grace about that. <laughs> so if you have a Bible, Luke 15, we're going to read a lot today. Uh, and we're going to start out with this story of the prodigal son. But really, there's more to the story of the prodigal son. You know, the, the prodigal son parable was the third of three parables in Luke 15. And these three parables, the first one was about uh, a woman who'd lost a coin. Uh, the next was a shepherd who'd lost one of his sheep. There was a hundred sheep and he'd lost one. He left the 99 to go find the one. And then there was the story of the lost son or the prodigal son. And, uh, but before any of the parables begin, there was a context within which Jesus told those parables. He told them for a reason to a certain and very specific audience. So let's read chap chapter 15 of Luke, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Just think about that just a second. Just stop right there. The tax collectors and sinners. I don't know, uh, I don't know anybody who likes taxes, right? But in the day of Jesus, man, tax collectors, they were bad. I mean, really, IRS people who work for the IRS, they're not, to me, it doesn't seem like they're that bad. But these guys were always the bad guy of the story, the tax collector. They were tax collectors and sinners. Like, how do you get in that group? You know, we often would say, hey, we're all sinners, right? Who, non-sinners, raise your hand. Well, nobody's going to raise your hand. But this group of people must have stood out as, you know, super sinners. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But verse 2, But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. I wonder how you do that. Yeah, there's muttering going on all around. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, I want you to think about that. That's the context of these three stories. And this is really important to hear this story of the prodigal son and the older brother in the context of these tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, and teachers of the law. Jesus eats with them. Let's pray. Father, today I pray that wherever we find ourselves in the story, uh, that your grace would flood our hearts and our lives, and we would be different people because of your great love for us. Help us to see it in a brand new way today. In Jesus' name, amen. So he tells the first two stories. He tells the story of the, of the uh, lost coin, then the lost sheep, and then he tells the story of what we know is the prodigal son. And that story is, whoops, back here. That story is the story we know. The boy leaves home. He squanders everything. He comes home, and the father sees him coming, stands up, and runs to him, right? And this is the great reunion of, and then it has a party of all things, has this great party. But what's, what's happening to the audience, especially the Pharisees and, and the teachers of the law, they've heard this story before. This is not a brand new story that Jesus made up. They've heard this story, and when the boy comes home from squandering everything, they have this expectation. They know what's going to happen next, and they're kind of like, okay, finally, Jesus is going to tell it straight and get on our side, because we're on the right side. And, and he's going to tell what's going to happen to those sinners and tax collectors. Because they're the boy who left home. And now he's come home. And what they expect is kezaza. Because this is a common story. It's not brand new. And what happens in kezaza is the community. When, and this usually happens in a couple of ways. It happens when a son. It's always the son in the, this culture. When the son marries someone beneath him. Now, some of you have married up. I can see you. Yeah, go ahead. Raise your hand. And you know what? In our audience today, and it's true, most of the people who are raising their hand, they're the men, you know? But this story of Kezaza is when a woman was beneath socially, 
or economically or educationally, she's a little lower class than this man. And the man marries and it shames his family. They're ashamed of him. And they have this ceremony. I'm going to tell you what the ceremony is in just a minute. But, but that's one case where they do a kezaza. Say it again. Kezaza. Yeah, a kezaza ceremony. But another case is when a man goes, he gets his inheritance, and often the inheritance is land, and, and then he sells it and wastes it. No one would ever, I mean, no one would ever do what the father and the, bo the boy in this story did, where he asked, the boy asked for his inheritance, inheritance before the father dies. Because that's just like saying, hey, you're dead to me, give me the money. And that's what happened, though, in this story. And so, man, what happens if you had squandered your inheritance, like this boy did, you would come home and you would also get a kezaza ceremony. And what happens in the kezaza ceremony, if, if, if a person like this is coming home because he's shamed and he's lost everything and he doesn't know what he's going to do, just like the boy in this story, what happened with the, the city elders... And the, and the leaders would gather around. And if they could, they'd catch him at the city gate. He's coming home. But sometimes they would do it in the city square. They would take a pot. Sometimes they would fill the pot with fruit. And they would circle the boy. And they would throw the pot down. Now, I thought about throwing this down, but then I thought about cleaning it up after. And I thought, yeah, weighing, when, you know... But they would throw the pot down, and it would crash. And sometimes they would come and stomp on the, on the unbroken pieces. And they would say, you are to us like this pot. We will not accept you. You do not have a home here. And kezaza means cutting off. You are, we are cutting you off from your family, and from this community. Never come back. That's what they expected. That's what the Pharisees expect a rabbi to teach. That's what everyone expected, except the father. And so the father, as we know in the story, he runs to the boy. And part of the reason some say that he ran is he wanted to get to his son before the elders who are going to bring the pot. And this is a shame story. The story is about this. You've shamed us by your behavior. And this boy had shamed his family and he'd shamed all the neighbors. He'd shamed the whole community. You've shamed us. So the Kezaza ceremony, we're going to shame you. And you'd have no place here at all. That's not what happened to this story, is it? Instead, the father runs to the boy. And he says, not only are we not going to do a Kezaza ceremony, we're going to have a celebration party. I'm going to put a ring on your finger. I'm going to put a robe around you. I'm going to put sandals on your feet, and we're going to kill the fattened calf. And the fattened calf, you know, there's just one of those a, a year usually, and it would be for the occasion of some major festival or holiday usually. And the father says, no, we're using it tonight because we're going to have the biggest party we've ever had here because this son has come home. And any shame that was going to be on him, it's going to be on me. And if you guys in the community, you don't like what I've done, I've taken my son back instead of cutting him off. Hey, you want to shame me? I'll take it. Because I love my son. Now then, here we go and we get to the part that is for us today. And I want to ask this question to you because the answer for me is yes. Do you ever resent someone who receives something good that they don't deserve? I do, because you know what? I think I deserve a lot, because I think I'm pretty good. I have a pretty high opinion of myself, usually, and uh, until I start looking in the mirror, kind of like Jeremy talking about playing the guitar, I'm pretty good. If you keep me on uh, the chords, I know, the three chords, I know. And, uh, but other than that, you know, so, so I'm being pretty good of myself. 
And I like, I like for people to tell me I'm good. I, I like that. I had a situation in, in college when I was playing football. My coach's name was K.Y. Owens. And I was a senior and by far the best defensive back on our team. I had the most interceptions. I had the most tackles. I, I was the only senior. Uh, there was a sophomore who was playing. I was played the corner, cornerback. He played the other side, cornerback. And he was pretty good. And he was going to be really good in a couple of years. And our coach would always praise him. And it wouldn't matter if I had knocked down more passes or inter had an interception or had more tackles. If he had done anything good, our coach was going to tell him all how great he was in front of everybody. And I'm like hacked off, you know. I'm sitting there kind of grumbling. And one day he noticed, you know, that I'm kind of pout face, you know. And he, 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 he gets it. And he says to me, Bob... Harold needs affirmation. You don't. And I'm like, I, yes, I do. <laughs> you know, I don't say that because, you know, that, that <laughs> but I'm like, I want to say, yeah, I'm that good. I don't need, bull, I needed some affirmation. I was, I was good and I wanted someone to notice, you know. And, and, but, but so somebody who gets something that they don't deserve bugs me. It bothers me, especially if I think I, I get it. So here we are in our story, and, and we're going to read this. So uh, <clears throat> we'll start in the second part of verse 20. Uh, the father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran to his son, and he kissed him. And, and then he said, I've sinned against you, but he doesn't listen. The dad doesn't. So verse 22 the father said to his servants, let's bring the robe and bring the ring and the sandals and let's kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a celebration. And in the end of verse 24, so they began to celebrate. They began to celebrate. And then we start our story, the story of the older son. Meanwhile, I love that, you know, scene change. Meanwhile... And you hear, I want you to hear some dramatic music in the back. Da -da. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, if you ever watch with uh, captions on your TV, you're watching the show on TV, and you got music, and it tells what kind of music it is. Let's just say, okay, we got dramatic. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. Of course he is. He's doing what he's supposed to do. You know, this kid, like many of us, he thinks life is a report card, and he's getting judged daily. Hey, how, how'd you do today? Did you do the chores? Did you do your chores? Did you clean up? Did you do you all this? He's in the field. And then it says, when he came near, he heard what? Music and dancing. And he asked the question, what's going on? I want you to imagine this. He's, he has no idea what's going on. The son's coming home. His brother's coming home. His brother's been dead to him, according to him, for years. And, and now he's coming home, and he comes up to the house from working, doing what he's supposed to do, and he hears there's a lot of noise going on. There's nothing on the schedule. There's nothing on the calendar that says party day. You know, nothing like that. What's going on? And, man, I'm, I'm feeling for him. If I'm watching this story, I'm going to say, uh-oh. I, 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 what's going on? And I, if I'm the person who's answering that question, I don't want to tell him the answer. So I want to say, hey, man, let's go fishing. <laughs> Forget what's going on at the house. Nothing. I don't hear anything. That's, I mean, what? And, and so he, the other guy, he tells him, the servant tells him, and man, he's not happy. It says he became angry and refused to go in. When, before you get, we get judgmental on this guy, I want you to think, have you ever been hurt so much that the expression you show was anger? Man, I have been. I want you to feel the pain in this boy's anger. Feel him. He's hurt. He feels rejected, and he refused to go in. 
Because in his world, this party going on, it's wrong. It's just wrong. This is not the way you be in this culture. It's wrong. And so, what happens next? His father went out to him and pleaded. Oh my goodness. First of all, the father's job is not to go out. The father in this culture, is he's, people are coming to him. He already went out to one son. He showed his love for that son by running to him. Well, he shows his love for this son too. Because he goes out to him. He goes out to the son like he had done to his other son. And then he pleads. I want you to feel the emotion of a father pleading. If you're a parent, what does that say to you? You're pleading with your child. Have you ever done that? Where your child is about to make a decision or they've maybe already made a decision and you know it's not a good one and you're pleading, you're begging, please. Something in your child's thinking in their heart somewhere is is off track and you're pleading. The dad is desperate. He's pleading. He knows that the soul of his son is at stake here. He's pleading. And the son says, all these years, he's still hacked off. I want you to hear anger in this. All these years, dad. All these years. I wonder how many years it really was, you know. Have you ever noticed some exaggeration when someone's angry about something? I wonder really, maybe maybe six weeks, I don't know. All these years, he says, I've been slaving for you. I wonder how does that make you feel if you're the dad? You've been slaving for me? You know, I want to say, like mamas say to their kids, I brought you into this world, I could take you out. (laughs) Slaving? We've been doing this together. We've run this farm, this Whatever business they were in, we've done this together. Slaving? What kind of attitude does that word represent? If you're the father or you're the mother and you're hearing someone say, man, all I got to do is I'm slaving for you all these years. And then he says, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Now, right here, don't you hear a little bit of self-righteousness maybe? Uh, He's graded himself on the curve a bit, like, I've never done anything wrong. Well, maybe compared to his brother, maybe he never, no one ever saw it. Some Some of you, how many of you, okay, how many of you in your family, you were the good kid? Okay, well, I'm gonna actually count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I got you. We're about half and half. You know, I was not the good kid, that'd be my sister Sally. Uh, but you know, this, this guy's the good kid. And he said, I've never, I'm self, (laughs) I've never done anything but obey your commands. I've been slaving for you. And look what you do for this guy. This guy who's shamed the family. Now, dad, dad, not only did he shame the family, you ran, you shamed the family. You're going to kill the fattened calf for him and for me. Not even a young goat. Like, dude, how about a hamburger once in a while? But no, he got nothing. And then he goes into this final stomping of his feet, temper tantrum. This son of yours spent spent all your money on prostitutes and crazy wild living. I mean, he's going to try and add shame on top of shame here. And the father, the father. Man, I just got to read these words. My son, because he's still that son. You are always with me. For For the dad, there's nothing, there's no gift he can give more than his presence. And the dad gives, you're with me all the time. And everything I have is yours. Everything. 
What do, you, what do you need? Do you want, you know, what do you need? Do you need a new plow? What do you need? Do you need what do you need? Everything I have is yours. And, and you're always with me. And, and your anger, I see it, and I'm, it's breaking my heart. The dad's heart is breaking. And he says, we had to celebrate. We had to. I mean, what else can you do? We had to be glad because your brother was dead. And now he's alive again. He was lost. Now he's found. And so as Jesus is telling this story, that's the end. And, and to me, it's like an abrupt end. It's, it's, there's there's, there's got to be another scene. You know, if, if all of a sudden I was watching this on television and it, and it cut to a commercial, I would be certain there would be another scene, right? Or you know how it does sometimes when you're, you're watching how much time is left, is this really going to resolve here? And then you think, uh-oh, this is going to have to be continued. You know, I'm, I'm expecting it to be continued in chapter 16. No. It's over. That's the end of the story. It's the, the son says, I've been slaving for you. The father says, we had to celebrate. Your brother was dead. And, and the guys who were in that original audience, the Pharisees, all of a sudden they know who the story's about. Boom. They are the older brother. He told this story for them to get to this point to say, now what you going to do? You have an invitation. You have an invitation to join the party or not. The father says, I'm going to throw a party because your brother's alive. And man, can you not get happy with that? That, that, that would be the great response to say, oh my gosh, I don't know what I was thinking, Dad. Let's party. Let's go. I like fattened calf. And I hear there's some inside. And there's a good band playing. Jeremy's playing the guitar. Let's go. Or stomp off. And you know, in that group of Pharisees, there were probably both. Now, in the Gospels, the Pharisees are bad guys all the way to the end and beyond. But there were always one or two of them that kept showing up at, with Jesus. There's Nicodemus, you know, and others. They had a choice to make. And they had a choice to make to that unanswered question. As I'm preparing for this, and man, this... this Sermon's been working on me for years and in a lot of different ways. One of the ways is from a book by Henry Nouwen called The Return of the Prodigal Son. And as in the, the book is uh, Nouwen's observation of Rembrandt's famous painting, The Re Return of the Prodigal. And this is in a museum and locked away in a room that people don't even get to see it. Uh, usually it's in one of the museums in Russia. It, it ta he talks about his experience uh, being able to go and sit and he sat for a couple of days just him and the painting and kind of listening to God. And, and he comes out with a book about his experience there and he says each of us should read this story as if we're the Lost son, as if we're the older brother, but also as if we're the father. How, how would we be the father in this situation? But in this portion about being the lost son, he offers two, I think, two things that we can do, that we can wrap our hands around in two ways to not become that older brother, have that older brother syndrome of, of bitterness, of resentment, of self-righteousness. And, you know, these are ways we, we, back to the title of the sermon, obstacles to grace are resentment and bitterness and self-righteousness. That keeps us from receiving uh, what God intends for us. And so there's a couple of things he suggests. I'm going to read them to you. <clears throat> 
Although God himself runs to find us and bring us home, we must not only recognize that we're lost, all of us, even that older brother who was lost, but we also must be prepared to be found and brought home. How? He says, by practicing the concrete daily disciplines, concrete daily disciplines of trust and gratitude. Okay, so here's what he says. Trust is the deep conviction that the father really wants you home. The older brother had a problem. He wasn't sure that the father loved him as much as he did the younger brother. And deep inside all of us, we fear, maybe I'm not his favorite. Trust is the point, he says, when you claim the truth that God wants to embrace me as much as he wants to embrace the wayward prodigal brother or sister I might have. He says he wants to embrace me not because I've been slaving for him, not because I'm the good son. He wants to embrace me because he's my father. I can never earn, I can never earn God's love. I can never earn the love of the Father. And all of my pompous self-righteousness is in itself a sham and a weak attempt to earn what can only be given as a gift. You have to trust that He loves you. And along with trust, there must be gratitude, the opposite of resentment. My resentment tells me that I don't receive what I deserve. I should have more. Gratitude claims the truth that all of life is a gift. In the past, and this is me right here for sure, in the past I always thought of gratitude as a spontaneous response to the awareness of gifts received. But now I realize that gratitude can also be lived as a discipline. It's the discipline of gratitude and its explicit effort to acknowledge that all that I am and all that I have is given to me as a gift of love. Gratitude as a discipline involves a conscious choice. I can choose to be grateful even when my emotions and feelings are still steeped in hurt and resentment. Hear that? I can choose to be thankful even when my feelings aren't feeling thankful, right? I can choose to be grateful instead of complaining even when things around me are going wrong. What? Even when my heart is bitter because I'm mistreated, my words can be grateful. Even when revenge and getting even is in my heart, I can still choose to forgive. I want you to think about that, about the choice we have to choose grace, to choose to receive grace, to choose to receive grace. By practicing these two disciplines, trust, trust that God loves me, that he's doing things on my behalf. Sometimes we, we believe that God's out to get me or that maybe he's forgotten me. But instead, I'm going to choose to trust that God loves me and he's doing good things on my behalf, even if I don't see him right now. And then I want to be thankful. I want to be grateful to God, thanking Him for maybe the little things when there aren't big things to celebrate. Some days there aren't big things to celebrate. Sometimes there are big things to grieve. But even in the middle of my grief, can I find other things to celebrate and to be thankful for? Today, man, the songs we've sung, when we sang Redeemed, I thought, Oh, this is the sermon right here. Until, until we sang, uh, who am I? Now, oh, whoa, this is the sermon right here. <laughs> but then really the sermon is this song we're getting ready to sing now. Uh, good, good father. Uh, we are all prodigal sons who've run away from home. But we're all also older brothers and sisters who have been home all along, but not really in the home of our father's heart. 
And the good news for us is, the good news of this story, whether you're like the audience, sinners and tax collectors, Pharisees, if you're, the good news for you if you're a Pharisee, we have a good, good father. The good news for you if you're a tax collector, we have a good, good father. That's the good news of today. Whether we're the older brother, the younger brother, we have a good, good father. Let's, let's sing, and I'll have a closing word in a minute.